Thanks for coming back. Um, so yesterday I tried to argue why it makes sense to, sin to think of certain types of quantum field theories, in particular in two dimensions, as symmetric monoidal functors. I gave a list of um, features of QFT that I wanted to capture, uh, that, that are supposed to be captured by this um, notion of a topological quantum field theory in two dimensions. And then we went through this list at least points one to eight. And point nine was boundaries and defects to which I want to come today. Um, and then I started from such a symmetric monoidal functor from the two-dimensional bordism category to the category of vector spaces, where here the objects are oriented circles, disjoint unions thereof, and morphisms between them are certain equivalence classes of bordisms, that is two-dimensional surfaces, where the circles are the boundary components. And here, objects and morphisms are respectively complex vector spaces and linear maps. Uh, along the way, there was a comment by Sylvain, which I misunderstood or where I was confused. I think he was asking whether the category of vector spaces together with taking direct sums and the zero vector space is also a monoidal um, category. And I said no, because I was confused. Of course it is. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's not true that this is not a monoidal category. However, it's also true that this is not the right monoidal category that we need to consider to do quantum physics. In quantum physics, we, we need to consider the tensor product over the complex numbers. So while this is a monoidal category, we won't consider it. One of the reasons why I was confused maybe is that it's true that given this functor, um, the, there's only one monoidal structure on VECT with this monoidal product up to isomorphism. But that, that wasn't the question, so I, I apologize. So, monoidal, but not good for us. <clears throat> okay, so towards the end yesterday, we saw that if we have such a functor, it associates to a circle, a vector space that I want to call A. To M circles, we will get the M full tensor product of A with itself because the functor is monoidal um, to a pair of pans that associates a linear map from A tends to A to A, A tends to A to A, which I denote just by concatenating elements. So um, to an element A tends to B, we get something called A times B in the vector space. And because of this identity here, between morphisms in this category, more precisely, this particular picture is supposed to present a representative of the same class as this picture represents a representative of a different morphism class. From this, it follows nearly immediately that this product here is associative. So, a times B and then times C is the same as A times the product of B and C for elements little a, b, c. Similarly, because of this identity, which I'll discuss a bit more in 10 minutes or so, or probably in an hour or so, um, this uh, multiplication is also commutative. Also, uh, from the bordism, which is the cup, a morphism from the empty set, that is no circles, to a single circle, we get a map from the unit object in VECT, which is the complex vector space C, to A. Um, and this is isomorphic to A, so I will identify this element with an element in here, and it's the unit with respect to this multiplication, because these identities hold. This um, bordism is diffeomorphic to the cylinder, as is this. You just shrink in this extra hump uh, or lump or whatever it is uh, into the cylinder. So that's as far as we got yesterday. Now I want to continue with that in order to give a more hands-on description which is equivalent of a symmetric monoidal functor from board 2 to vect. The last thing that I need to consider for this is a bent over cylinder. So this is a 
Buddhism from two circles to zero circles. And to this, um, this is mapped, of course, to Z of that Buddhism, which is a map from A, tensor A, to C. And instead of writing Z of blah, 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 I'll denote it by pointy brackets. This is a map from A, tensor A, to the complex numbers, which would take an element from here, put it there, take an element from the right factor and put it there. And the claim is that this um, pairing on A is non-degenerate. So that's a non-degenerate pairing, which in particular implies that the vector space A is finite dimensional, as we discussed in the exercises yesterday. Uh, let me mention this. The dimension over the complex number of A, hence, is finite dimensional. Um, this is something that we more or less checked last time uh, uh, in, in the exercises. And also, it's true that the product of A times B with C is equal. So the product of A times B paired in this pairing with an element C is equal to A paired with the product B times C for every vectors A, B, and C in capital A. And that's because Um, because of basically the same relation as up there in brown, but with a cap on top of it. So this is Z of this Bordism here, applied to A tensor B and then C. And this is equal to Z applied to this here. Remember, the convention is that we read these diagrams, these pictures, always from bottom to top and from right to left. So these two together here. Oh, it's a cap. And these two are multiplied together first with a pair of pants, and then comes the second pair of pants. Now, such a property, uh, such a situation where we have an associative algebra together with a non-degenerate pairing on the underlying vector space, such that this pairing is compatible with the multiplication in this way. One also speaks of an invariant pairing, that multiplying two elements in the left argument and then taking the pairing with the, the remaining thing is equal to multiplying the rightmost two arguments and then taking the pairing with the leftmost thing. This is called a Frobenius algebra, then. OK, I just realized maybe not everyone knows the name Frobenius, often called Frobenius. It's spelled F-R-O-B-E-N-I-U-S. OK, so what we found now is that if we have a symmetric monoidal functor from ball 2 to vect, hence a closed TQFT, then from this we can extract in precisely this manner a commutative Frobenius algebra. Oh, I see. I re okay, good. Um, so for those sitting over there, I just said that, like I said here, um, these properties, a multiplication which is associative and unital, means it's an algebra. Here I said a non-degenerate pairing, which is compatible in precisely this way for all elements A, B, C, is called a Frobenius algebra. And because of these arguments, we have seen that given the TQFT, we get a commutative Frobenius algebra, this one. And surprise, or uh, wonderfully, uh, also the reverse is true. So they are really equivalent. So one can prove that two-dimensional closed TQFTs are equivalent to commutative Frobenius algebras over the complex numbers. Yes? Uh, who is that, uh, uh, who is it you to 
Yeah, that's a good question. Who is it due to? Um, I've, I've heard uh, Ezra Getzler claim that some algebraic topologists in the 80s or 70s realized this, before there was even the notion of a TQFT. I think typically it's attributed to people like Dijkgraaf, Witten, Atia in the late 80s, early 90s. So I'm not sure who to attribute it to, um, which is one of the reasons why I didn't give a name. But thanks for the question. Yes? Uh, can all Prometheus, community Prometheus algebras be realized as a functor? So, sorry, I couldn't hear. Can all of these Prometheus algebras be realized as this kind of functor? Th that's the claim, yes. So the claim is that if you have a commutative Frobenius algebra, then to this you can associate to, um, a symmetric monoidal uh, functor between board 2 and vect. So you're defining TQFT in that way? No. I, I define, a, um, yesterday I defined a TQFT to be a symmetric monoidal functor from board 2 to vect. Here I um, try to explain how I get a commutative Frobenius algebra out of that. And the theorem says that what I just did is true, plus if you give me a commutative Frobenius algebra, from this I can already construct such a functor, which is a non-trivial statement about the geometry of, two of surfaces. And I won't prove that. But um, uh, this is, for example, covered in the book by Joachim Koch, where, for example, you can do it using Morse theory of surfaces. <clears throat> and the point, uh, one of the points to make here is that, well, you might think that symmetric monoidal functors are complicated, maybe um, you won't have the opinion that finite dimensional algebras with pairings and so on are very complicated. And I, I want to add to this by now giving a number of examples of commutative Frobenius algebras, which many of which will probably be quite familiar. Any further questions before I move to examples? OK. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, um, maybe I should have um, uh, said more about this, this interpretation that we had yesterday. These points 1 to 8 that features, featured twice yesterday, said that um, the vector space A is interpreted as the space of states. The non-degenerate pairing is interpreted as the, uh, a way to compute correlation functions or correlators. The, the product in the algebra is uh, interpreted as the OPE, and so on. Thank you. OK, so here's the good morning example. Uh, let's take the C vector space C together with a pairing on C tends to C, which takes two vectors, lambda and mu, that is complex numbers, and defines this pairing. So this will be valued in C, as on the top right corner in the middle board. And unsurprisingly, we choose the product of these complex numbers. That's an element in C. This is the trivial commutative Frobenius algebra. I'll abbreviate such things. The multiplication is the multiplication in C, and so on. So great, example number one. Let's now move to derived categories. Well, not quite yet. Um, let us take a positive integer n, and let us write b for n times n matrices whose entries are complex numbers, um, together with matrix multiplication <coughs> with matrix multiplication and the unit matrix. This forms an algebra, an associative unital algebra. And I want to define a pairing of a matrix M with a matrix M prime. So uh, 
This will be a linear map from B tensor B to C. What is the number that I associate to M and M prime in this way? Uh, this I define to be the trace of the product of the two matrices. And we know that this defines a Frobenius algebra because um, it's compatible in this sense because it's defined in terms of a trace. So A times B times C is equal to A times B times C. Under the trace, this is true as well. And this trace pairing is non-degenerate as most of us learned in the first semester at university. Or you can read it up in the linear algebra book if you like. But I don't include commutative here because as we certainly all learned in the first year at university, um, two by two matrices um, do not form an, a commutative algebra. So the, the, uh, uh, the sequence in which we multiply matrices makes a difference. So this is non-commutative for integers larger than one. So that's uh, bad news, but we can improve on that by looking at a subalgebra of this matrix algebra that I call B. And this I want to call A. A is the center. So I try hard to write my functors curly Z and the center which I'm about to define non-curly. Maybe in this particular case you can't really see it, but I always say it. So the center of the matrix algebra B is defined to be the subalgebra made of all n by n matrices such that m times m prime is equal to m prime times m for every m prime, so for every matrix uh, 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 square algebra. Uh, one checks that this is a subalgebra. And this together with the pairing as above, or rather to the left, this is a commutative Frobenius algebra. And since I think it's not, it's not obvious to me right away that this is true, I'll I'll admit that. Please. Uh, yesterday, you had among your axioms uh, or your requests, you had unitar that there was a unitary operator for revolution, and then the, the unitarity property sort of got swept away. A little bit. Oh, you noticed. Uh, and here, uh, you might wonder whether you can make this pairing sort of uh, positive by adding some involutive uh, operation, <coughs> some sort of style product. Is that the thing that makes sense, or is not this, it's not necessarily the context, I guess, but. So um, you know, the question is about uh, what about the unitary aspect of evolution that I talked about at the beginning yesterday, and this is not baked in here. So uh, I think that's because um, vector spaces by themselves don't have enough structure. So we, we, we do consider complex vector spaces, but not together with, um, with the unitary structure, so with the scalar product. So you, you can, of course, improve on that. You can say, oh, it's a TQFT in two dimensions plus extra structure but there's no need to do it. So, so this is not naturally captured just by this notion. Yes? Uh, doesn't this example just trivially reduce the first one when you start working with the center? Good point. That's true. Uh, I wasn't quite done yet, um, but uh, that, that's true. So this, this is a fancy way of uh, talking about the trivial example because the center is, uh, that does give such a vector space. However, it's also a good way for me to go to example numbers three and five. Thanks for checking. All right. Um, so here's example number three. This does have a name. It's called the two-dimensional version of digraph Witten theory, I think from the early 90s. Uh, models. So here, 
let us take a finite group. Let G be a finite group. Any finite group. Then the so-called group algebra that we can associate to this group is typically denoted CG, sometimes with square brackets around the G, which as a set can be thought of as linear combinations over C of uh, group elements. This can be made more precise, but I think for our purposes that's good enough. That's a set, so how is it a vector space and an algebra? Together, so this set together with um, addition of an element lambda g times g, sum over g, and let's say uh, h mu h times h is defined to be the sum over all g and g, lambda g plus mu g times g, unsurprisingly. Um, scalar multiplication is defined by taking a number, a complex number, and just putting it here. And the multiplication um, as part of the algebra structure is as follows. You have g lambda g g. If you want to multiply this with uh, h mu h h, this is defined to be g and h both in capital G, lambda g, mu g, g times h. g times h, again, is an element in G. So this is some linear combination uh, of elements in G. Thank you. <coughs> mu h times g h. Um, incidentally, um, one of the bases that you can choose for this vector space, this algebra, uh, is the set of uh, group elements. So that's the algebra structure. So that's the, the first board. How does it become a Frobenius algebra? This algebra together with a pairing which takes elements G and H, or linear combinations thereof, so I define it by linear extension. And by definition, gives the number one if and only if g is equal to h inverse um, and zero otherwise. This gives a non-degenerate pairing. And you can check as a short exercise that this is really also compatible with um, the multiplication as in the middle on this board over here. So this is. Again, a Frobenius algebra. But unless the group G is abelian, it will not be a commutative Frobenius algebra. And a way to get a commutative Frobenius algebra is to take the center of this group algebra, which is the subalgebra that commutes with every other element, which is not necessarily one dimensional. So the center of the group algebra is a commutative Frobenius algebra. OK. All these first three examples share the property that they are rather simple, or at least semi-simple, in a in a technical way. I also want to give one example of a commutative Frobenius algebra, which is not semi-simple. One that fits into the setup that we've developed so far. It goes under the name of Landau-Ginsburg models. Oh, 
of which I only want to um, discuss what I think is the simplest class of models. So here we define the algebra A, which we want to become, or we want to endow with the structure of a commutative for Venus algebra, to be the C vector space, or C algebra, of polynomials with complex coefficients in one variable. And then we divide out by the ideal generated um, by the polynomial x to the n for, for some integer uh, for some integer n. Which uh, you probably know very well means that this is a finite, this is an inf the cx is an infinite dimensional vector space. x to the n is a subvector space, which consists only of linear combinations of x to the n and higher degree. Uh, that there's lots of higher degrees than n. There's only finitely many degrees lower than n. So if you divide this infinite dimensional vector space out, you get something finite dimensional in this particular case. Namely, it is an uh, n-dimensional commutative algebra. It's commutative because this algebra is commutative. So you multiply elements in here by taking representatives, which are polynomials, then multiply them as, multi as polynomials, and then view them as representatives in this quotient. Uh, and it's an, al yeah, it's an algebra because you can multiply polynomials. And if you like, you can uh, consider one of the many bases that this vector space has. For example, the set 1, which is x to the 0, x, which is x to the 1, x to the 2, and so on, up to x to the n minus 1. That is a basis. x to the n is equal to 0 in this vector space because it's divided out. <clears throat> uh, so it's an n-dimensional commutative algebra. What is a pairing that I can endow this with such that the pairing is compatible with the multiplication of polynomials? As in the previous example, I will define the pairing by saying what it does on a basis and then linearly extend so that I know what it does on every element. And I just claim that uh, this is the basis. So what is the pairing of the vector x to the i with the vector x to the j? And by definition, it's the residue of the product of the two x to the i times x to the j is x to the i plus j, dx divided by x to the n, which is what we have here. And you know that this is equal to uh, 0 unless n minus i minus j is equal to 1. Now you can check that this is indeed a commutative Frobenius algebra. Maybe. Ah, uh, and this gives a Frobenius pairing. So this defines a non-degenerate pairing that is compatible with the multiplication of polynomials. <clears throat> is there a question regarding this example? Yes? Excuse me? Oh, right. Yeah, I think I have a different way of writing residues in mind. So uh, in, in many circles, it would be more standard not to write the dx there. Uh, I, would, I would like to make the side remark, which is not relevant for uh, following anything of the rest. Of what I have to say that this particular example, um, first one can check this is an, for n larger than 1 or 2. Uh, this is uh, a non semi simple commutative Frobenius algebra. 
So it's more interesting in the sense that it's not semi-simple. And more relevantly for physics, this happens to be isomorphic as an algebra to the so-called ring of chiral primary fields of, an, of a supersymmetric version of the minimal models of type uh, A n minus 1. So in Servant's talks, there was an A series of minimal models without supersymmetry. There was a skipped D series. And there also was a skipped E series. Um, and if, if you look at supersymmetric versions of the vera zora algebra um, of type so-called n equals 2 comma 2, there's also A, D, and E type of minimal uh, representations of uh, the supersymmetric vera zora algebra. And there are uh, um, primary fields and very wonderful chiral, uh, very, very special primary fields, the so-called chiral primary fields. And studying them and understanding them in a given supersymmetric CFT is one of the important first orders of business in such studies. And one way to do this is using Landa Ginsburg theory. And this is precisely the chiral ring. Moreover, um, there's a general way, if one has an n equals 2 comma 2 superconformal vertex operator algebra, there's always something that can be called a BST differential. And taking its cohomology always gives a commutative Frobenius algebra. This is one example. Mm -hmm. Well, in each case, you choose a specific linear form, but could you choose a more general linear form? What do you mean? So you're asking about um, um, how much freedom I have in the choice of the, the Frobenius pairing? Yes. Like the trace, instead of the trace, like any linear operation, maybe? I'm a bit embarrassed to say that right now. I'm not entirely sure, but I think it's unique. I think it's unique up to isomorphism. At least it's not true that um, I can take just any other non-degenerate pairing because it must be compatible with the multiplication, as in the middle over there. But unfortunately, I'm not certain. So let me think about it and try and give a better uh, response later. Further questions or comments? OK, then um, I want to come to example number five, which is called state sum models. Which unfortunately um, is slashed, so I will not discuss state sum models, uh, even though I prepared beautiful drawings with colored pictures. Um, but it takes a little too long, and it take, would take us off course. So I, I, can only, I only want to say that I invite you to study them by yourself, if you like. And I, I want to mention that it would have been great to have more time to discuss them, as they are, among other things, very closely related to the orbifold construction in CFT that Thomas mentioned prominently. So for example, uh, you might wonder, in example number three, what is the physical reason that I should consider the center. So if I start with a group algebra of a given symmetry group G, as in example three, what forces me? Is there a, a deeper principle that leads me to um, compute the center of the group algebra? And the state sum construction uh, originally in physics due to Fukuma, Hosono, and Kawai uh, gives an answer, gives a good answer to that, to that question. Um, instead, I want to now very brief, briefly make some concluding remarks about closed TQFT and then move on to open and open closed TQFTs where things become uh, richer than in the closed case. So very roughly, my convention is that remarks are not very precise statements that are worthwhile anyway. Um, re remark number one, 2D closed TQFTs, as we, we've been discussing, are just certain finite dimensional algebras over the complex numbers. 
as opposed to functors of certain types that are not so familiar, possibly. And these are algebras together with clear, with a clear physical interpretation. Some of which we discussed in items one to eight. So this is uh, here. I just repeat that this is a great theorem. Left side, left hand side, not so familiar for many of us. Right hand side, easier, more familiar. Then number two, what is what is what is one way to think about this nice description in terms of finite dimensional algebras which have more or less easily accessible properties and structures um, accessible from physics. And this, this is rooted in geometry, one could argue. This nice description comes from the fact that Every surface embedded into R3 can be decomposed can be decomposed into what one might think of basic building blocks or generators. I want to give the generators a name, G, C. G for generators, C for closed, as in closed TQFT. And they are precisely the pair of pans, a morphism from two circles to one circle. The upside down pair of pans, a morphism from one circle to two circles. And the uh, cap and the cup. So. Every surface that can be embedded into R3 can be chopped up into these basic pieces. And uh, this can be made more precise. The precise statement that I will first uh, read out and write down is the following, and then I'll um, try and interpret this. This category, board two, is freely generated as a symmetric monoidal category by these generators GC with relations that I call RC for relations in the closed sector. And before I show you the, the generators and relations in pictures uh, on, on the board, uh, on, the, on the screen, let me point out that towards our half of the proof of this theorem, we already made use of most of these uh, relations. So for example, to see that the multiplication is associative, we used a relation that is an identity between two morphisms from three circles to one circle up there. And here, to show that the pairing is compatible with the multiplication, we used um, another such relation, where also the cap features. Thanks. So this is uh, the first page of a handout that, that is in the Dropbox folder. Please ignore the second half for the moment. Um, the first half says that there are these generators GC, these four pictures, pair of pans and disk, that is cup and cap. And then a number of equations, I count something like 10, a little less maybe. Um, that say that two uh, bordisms are obviously equal or are claimed to be equal. So for example, the first relation between these triple-legged triple pans, they are more or less obviously 
um, representing the same diffeomorphism class of bordisms. And the same is true for the upside down version and for um, the, the second line in RC, which discusses units and co-units. And then we also have uh, those relations which are called the Frobenius relations that I don't want to dwell on. And um, uh, this, uh, this statement that is written there as well, this board, board two is freely generated as a symmetric monoidal category by these generators and relations, um, basically means that every surface can be chopped up into these basic parts. And if you want to do any manipulations, the only relations that you need, the only identities that you need for any relevant calculation are those relations um, given over there. Since the generation is in terms of a symmetric monoidal category, I don't have to list the, the braiding explicitly. This is discussed in much, really in a lot of detail in those lecture notes by Ingo Runkel and myself that are also in the folder. If, if you care, you can read about that. And um, so, and, and be, because we understand two-dimensional geometry so well that we can say every surface can be chopped up into such and such basic pieces, and these are the basic relations between them, we can also represent uh, this geometry in this way. That's the point that I wanted to make actually yesterday already. Um, my first example of a functor was called rho, and I, I tried to argue that a functor from BG to vect was the same thing as a G representation, a representation of a group G. Now, a TQFT is a functor from Bohr 2 to Vect. So you can think of this, um, this toy model of physics in two dimensions as a representation of two-dimensional geometry, or rather topology, plus a little, on vector spaces and linear maps as a, as a rough idea. I think that's worthwhile to have in mind. Now I want to move on uh, in the lecture course to discuss um, also surfaces that have other types of boundaries that come with extra labels, which are interpreted as physical boundary conditions. Um. <coughs> Would you mind helping me with, with those boards? Thanks. Uh, like now? It's uh, one minute before one time. Okay. Um, maybe three more pictures? Is, is that good enough? Yeah, yeah then, then we can wait. Then I'll just fill this board. Is it okay if I fill this board? Okay, thank you. So, remark number three. Uh, in topological quantum field theory, uh, it's true that states are as good as what in other parts of physics proper would be called only an asymptotic state. And they are the same thing as states inserted at punctures. And what I mean by that is that if I have some surface sigma by the way, when I used sigma on a surface, I meant any surface. So it could have any number of, uh, any number of holes, any genus. And then if, if the out comes a trunk with one boundary component at the end, and on this I insert a phi, so I view this after, um, so now I can make precise what I used to not understand. What does it mean to insert a phi at the end of such a long trunk? Uh, it means first apply the TQFT, and then this becomes a linear map from somewhere to somewhere, maybe to C. And this can then be applied to a state phi. And this geometry is, uh, as, is equal to the same surface sigma with a little hole here, and then this is labeled by phi. So this is a boundary component. I just uh, shortened the trunk. And this is as good as a bordism in board two, as just a little tiny hole, which I think of intuitively as shrinking the size of the circle to a point. 
that's, I think, that's what I have in mind when people talk about um, fields inserted at punctures. After the break, I'll give a similar picture for um, boundary conditions and boundary condition changing operators. Are there any questions or comments now? Yes? This picture that you described is the picture that people use in scattering efforts in string theory of the world sheet. It's exactly the same. Yes. But it's, uh, you're right. So th these are the types of uh, diagrams that are used, for example, to compute scattering amplitudes. But, but there, people, I think, tend to work with special states, namely asymptotic states. This is a distinction that I cannot make. And that, that's the point that I wanted to make. In TQFT, there's no distinction between states and asymptotic states. Yes? So not, not every um, maximal, the question is, are there other constructions if you start with the Frobenius algebra that is not commutative to make a commutative, to produce a commutative Frobenius algebra out of that? And you, you're asking whether it's possible to take any commutative subalgebra. It, it's not clear that the um, induced pairing will still be non-degenerate. That, that's a condition. Okay, see you in a bit.